Turn on this. All righty. Hello, everyone. My name is Akari, and I'm a programs fellow here at AMP Global Youth. And I'm here today to talk with one of our incredible climate visionaries, Eric Steinberger. Eric is the co founder and CEO of Climate Science, a UK based charity with volunteers around the globe. Climate Science aims to make climate education accessible, accurate, and engaging for young people. Eric has a strong scientific background in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and physics. At just 14, Eric began studying computer science online. Since then, he's attended Cambridge University, done research at MIT and Facebook, and been named to Forbes 30 under 30 list. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the kind intro. It's a pleasure to be here. All righty. Well, let's hop directly into some questions. So you run an international climate education startup. What do you think is the key to reaching and engaging learners on a global scale? Empathy. Uh, I think we need to understand what people, how people need to be presented with the information. You know, I think having just presenting information is not sufficient if your goal is for people to actually, you know, have, have re to read it. Um, it says, you know, unfortunately, we see that. Uh, propaganda promoting initiatives are much better at understanding this than than science communicators. Um, so I think it's it's time for sort of science communicators across um, uh, topics and, and fields, not just in climate, uh, but especially in climate, uh, to really learn that and to understand that it's not just about saying the numbers; it's also about how you say them. I love that. I think that especially hits home as we enter year two, three of the pandemic with misinformation flying around everywhere. At least yeah, where weirdly, like those promoting misinformation. And I, I do I do want to say like misinformation is used very well. There's lots of misinformation. There's also just some uncertainty in some things, which is totally fine and viable. But where mis misinformation is promoted, unfortunately, we see that those people are very good at empathetically, emotionally um, reaching people where uh, scientists are typically not. So I, I agree, like it's very much applicable to the pandemic too. Absolutely, fantastic. Well, uh, your background and training is largely in computer science and physics. What brought you into climate work and the climate movement? I Googled how to solve climate change and I wasn't satisfied with the answers. So we built better answers. Now we rank first when you Google climate science. Wow, look at that folks. There, is, <laughs> there are you there are participants around the globe. There's nothing they want to hear more than that because every single one of them has done that. So every single yeah, one. See, like I'm a nerd. That's what I, I, if I had to describe myself with one word, like sure, I look, I look for whatever. But I'm, I'm a nerd by heart. That's why I studied computer science. And uh, I, I, so, you know, when you have a question, you Google it and uh, you expect, a, so I started, as you said, I started studying online very early through programs like MIT OpenCourseWare, Khan Academy, just so, you know, the, the fun stuff that's there for curious kids. Uh, and then I found answers to pretty much all the questions I Googled, but I didn't find an answer to how to solve climate change, which oddly, given it's one of the most important challenges of our generation, I did think should be uh, there. And it wasn't. Uh, There's lots of conflicting information. So as you said, we, we felt we needed to provide something better. Hence, uh, I did uh, put uh, quite a lot of my time over the last uh, two and a half years uh, into climate and climate education. Uh, learned a lot on the way myself. I'm not a climate scientist. So uh, it was a great educational journey for me too. Uh, luckily, we have a great team. So learning a lot from them. Truly, and that I think is so powerful for a background of youth in our community. Alrighty. Well, you think young people in climate work are often spoken over and even disregarded, even when they're wielding data and science on their side. Are there ways in which you've been ignored in your time fighting for climate action? And how do you deal with them? I can't recall that uh, personally. Um, so I, I hear that actually quite often. It's so surprising to me because no, I, I really haven't um, had that problem, luckily. I don't know, maybe it's it's a, an approach. I think a lot of people walk into conversations with the intention to convince others uh, and to to change their their mind on and change their opinion, which immediately puts you in the shoes of the, the one trying to, you know, by, by trying to have an effect, you leave it open for the other side in a conversation to determine whether you're successful or not. And hence, you may be ignored. And frankly, if someone tried to convince you that climate change is not important, you may also be uh, you, choosing, you may also choose to ignore that person. So, you know, while clearly the science is on the side of, of climate change being incredibly important, I, I think from an, again, an empathetic and emotional perspective, it's very important how you do it. So maybe I haven't faced this problem because I, I try to not approach things with the let's convince the other person methodology. If someone asks and if someone is curious to learn more about climate change, 
uh, they they will. And and then if someone asks me a question about it, I will answer it. And then I tend to not be ignored because they ask the question. Uh, when it comes to things like partnerships and talking to you know sort of, uh, leaders of various in various places, uh, it's it's again like typically. Um, it just depends. You, you can't really be ignored if you um, only talk to people or open a conversation. And I, I just choose to not run after people. So if if someone chooses to be a climate denier, um, okay, we live in a in a world that's just composed of a lot of atoms with the basic rules being determined simply by physics and not by by ethics. So I can't change that. the The rules of the universe don't make me um, don't give me the capability to do so. Uh, and, and I find weirdly, the less you try to convince people, the more you convince people. So in, in a way, it's kind of worked the other way around. Wow, that, that's powerful, especially me and others as activists who have struggled to convince so many people. Well, I don't, th I think it's important that we have activism to raise awareness, but see, this yeah. is the big difference. We use the word raise awareness to convince people, which is not the same thing. Raise awareness is here are the scientific facts. Now do what you want with them. Uh, convincing is here are the scientific facts. Do this, do this, do this, which we also, I don't think that's bad. That we, It's good for political pressure. Voter ratios go up. It's great. Fantastic. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. But our metric shouldn't be have we convinced the climate deniers. Our metric should be have we implemented climate policies. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just recently in the EU, I'm a big supporter of nuclear energy, scientifically absolutely obvious that it's a good thing. And the EU has recently decided to choose the side of rationality rather than the side of emotion in their decision making processes, which I'm gladly uh, surprised by. And uh, so, so really, you know, big thank you to the EU for making that choice. And, and similarly, I think that comes from climate activism in a way that, that comes from, from many of the loud voices that have faced lots of opposition. Um, uh, so so I, it, it's not black and white. Like, so when, when I said that, you know, convincing people doesn't mean that you shouldn't be loud. Uh, it just means that your metric shouldn't be whether you were ignored by some people. That's just the wrong metric. So even if you are like, maybe I am and I just don't notice, I don't know. But yeah, I wouldn't pay attention to it so much if I were, if I were an activist, I would just look at you know, are policy changes being made? And if so, you've been successful. Most of the time, the people you do convince are silent. They won't come to you and tell you that you've convinced them. They won't come to you and give you a plus one in your in your database of convinced people, you know? So, okay. so they yeah. listen to something you say, they find something you wrote, uh, they attend a protest, they walk past on the street and they go like, huh, this is interesting. Maybe I should read more about it. And you never hear about it. So, um, you know, Think about how you kind of quantify your success as an activist in that sense, because I don't think you have to look at just the most ignorant climate denier and take their evaluation of your statement as the metric. I don't think that's the that's the wise oh, way to I do it. certainly appreciate that. I think sometimes we do let our emotions and the deepest, worst climate denier to get a hold of our brains. And yeah, the, the truth is that's a very small percentage of the population, and you do not have to care. Like those, if you try to convince those people, you miss out on the vast, vast majority who are just normal humans living their life and having their priorities based on their, around their children and spouse and like doing their day to day job and not really having studied science and hence not understanding the full spectrum of the climate impacts we will face, understandably and rightfully so. I mean, who, how could we expect everyone to be a scientist? Um, so though that's the majority of people, they're not climate deniers, they're just focused on their normal life. And, you know, you reach those very differently than you, you talk to a climate denier, it's just useless, wasting your time. It's one person. Democracy is about many people. Absolutely. Uh, what do you think young people should know as they engage in climate work? And what's your top piece of advice? Ooh, that's a difficult one. It's like a an... big question, I know. Um, really a big, it's a big I think what they should know, well, I, I, will, can, I will slightly reinterpret your question. I think it's really important to approach everything you do with uh, the, the mind, like a problem solving mindset. And if you want to get anything done. So when you work on climate in any sort, like start by actually understanding what that means. Um, like we all agree that climate change is important, but when we go and, you know, we, we, we choose to have a, we choose to use our voice in support of something, we have to understand what we support. So like either say Greta takes the very honorable approach of saying, uh, just do what the scientists say, because they know better than I do, which I hugely admired from the start when she did it. Cause yes, that's what, you know, how Greta is not a scientist. She's certainly as smart as one, but uh, she doesn't have the credentials. And instead of putting herself into the fire of, oh yeah, you don't have those credentials. She get that, that got that fire unrightfully anyway. But um, uh, she said, you know, look at the scientists. So I think if you, what, what I would say is whatever you want to do working in climate on climate change, try to first get familiar with 
um, like what we actually as a humanity should be doing, what steps we should be taking, um, and and then promote them at the depth you feel comfortable um, really kind of arguing for in a sense, not because you will have to argue about it, but just because we want to make sure the climate movement remains um, based on facts, because that's our whole point. Um, and if we start walking around demanding things that are impossible or not even optimal, um, that's that's a problem as well, because it's going to diminish the credibility of those claims and those um, uh, demands that are uh, very real and practical. So uh, I think that would be my first point is make sure to understand what you do and stand for. Uh, I admire anyone who takes the time to participate in climate activism. Um, I, I, do, I do suggest like take a few hours, take a few days or a week. Feel free to start with our courses. Um, they're good, hopefully. Um, and uh, then you, you have a better picture of what the world should do. Uh, my, my best piece of advice, you said, um, is that the same thing that I already answered that essentially? Um, I don't I don't know. I think advice, yeah, don't take advice too much. That's my best piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> the own solving try try stuff um it teaches you much more than just taking learnings from someone else and try to do stuff efficiently like try lots of things at once so you have the experiences needed and then yeah things will make a lot of sense when you try your question marks yeah absolutely if you're watching check out climate science they have some amazing lessons on the website <laughs> Alrighty, one last question for you. So you've expressed a lot of optimism in the past regarding progress on climate change, namely in your TED talk with UC Irvine. With the release of last year's IPCC report and the nickname in the media, Code Red for Humanity, has your position changed? No, I would say it actually got better. Um, so that, that like multiple tracks on climate progress that are that work in parallel. One is policy. The other one is sort of fundamental innovation that will only see the light of day in years. And then there's deployment and, and change in existing businesses, right? And then there's activism, and there are probably a million more that I'm forgetting, please forgive me. Um, so the, the, for climate change to be fully solved, we need a few things to be there. We need to have the technological ability to replace what we currently do with uh, green alternatives. And then we need to have the financing to actually do that. And we need to have the policy and uh, sort of political opinion world uh, uh, ecosystem to, to support that, to actually make it happen. Um, on a capital front, there is such an enormous amount of money flowing to climate now that I, I know a lot of climate investors. And trust me, it's not that the startups are struggling to find funding, it's that the investors are struggling to find startups these days. <laughs> So funding, not an issue. Uh, large scale funding, well, I, I attended COP26 and there was like one side event in the Nordic pavilion, which sounds about as big as it, which is about as big as it sounds, namely not. It's one small pavilion, somewhere in between a hundred other pavilions in one of the many exhibition halls. And there was one event there, a random 9 a.m. Tuesday or something, I don't remember the day, it was 9 a.m., uh, where you had five Nordic presidents and prime ministers come uh, and announce a $130 billion pension fund investment to climate uh, into climate. This event had 40 attendees. COP26 was attended by tens of thousands of people. That should give you an idea of how much actually happens, because that was not one of the main events. That was just something that happened. $130 billion from pension funds in Nordic region directed to climate. Sure, let's do that at Tuesday at 9 a.m. Um, so money is not a problem anymore. Um, the, the, the voices that think so, I don't think they interact much with the capital markets, frankly. Um, and uh, Sure, there's still lots of investment in fossil fuels, but that's not the point. The point is, do we have the alternatives? And then we replace the fossil fuels eventually. Um, that's still obviously important, but the really important part is, is climate funded, not is other stuff not funded. Um, so climate is funded, track one. Why I'm optimistic there? Simply because I see enormous amounts of money flowing that way, and that's just reality. Um, and, and so then you have the innovation front. Um, I'm lucky enough to chat with a lot of uh, other startup founders in, in, in various areas, everything from agriculture to energy. I don't believe that much in carbon capture, but I, I do think energy and, ag and, and agriculture are making good progress on the technology and innovation front. Uh, things like geothermal energy, high temperature, very deep drilling through geothermal energy uh, will be an incredibly important part in the future. Even crazy things like fusion are making progress, uh, like Commonwealth fusion systems in Boston, not necessarily part of the near-term solution, but certainly of the long-term solution. Uh, there is good innovation in fission nuclear power plants, solar panels and uh, energy storage are actually getting better now. Well, solar panels have been getting better for a very long time. Energy storage is starting to actually get better now. It's been kind of on a long ride. Um, 
various technologies there. Uh, and uh, so all these things combined, you know, 76% of global emissions coming from energy, um, again, give me lots of enthusiasm that energy is going to get there eventually. Um, is it going to get there very fast um, and very soon? Probably not as fast as we would like it to, but it will eventually. Um, and we keep accelerating and accelerating. Hopefully we get there before we hit any like incredibly high temperature um, limit. But anyway, so that technological foundation is there. The one I'm more worried about is the political one. Um, and, and that's something that I think though, like activists like, like yourself and many others like us can, can have a good influence on by work focusing on education. You know, we, we reach schools, we shape um, how children think about climate change, how, how companies who we work with think about climate change. That's, uh, that's gonna be the bigger, bigger open question mark is whether we can have a stable political environment that supports climate action. Because um, that's, you know, past years, even with Fridays for Future and so on, hasn't proven to build a very stable political support system for, for climate, even though many people act like it existed in the political sphere. I agree with Greta that there is mostly blah, blah, blah in that. Um, but again, also lots of financial action still, but we need to see, we need to see more things like carbon tax being implemented globally. It's just ridiculous that we don't have a global carbon tax or well, carbon taxes globally. They are coming, they are starting. So again, it's making progress, but um, why am I optimistic? I, I, I don't listen much to like high level opinions. Like there will be people who tell you, oh, I'm optimistic. Oh, I'm pessimistic. Oh, code red. Oh, go blah, right? Noise. If you read 20 of them, you don't end up any smarter afterwards. You're just confused. Um, so look at the very fundamental things that are happening. Is money flowing? Are decisions being made? Are technologies getting developed? Are they getting deployed? Do people support all that? What are the problems? Look at the fundamental parts of it and you will be more optimistic. Um, don't listen to me, just read the stuff and look at look at things, talk to people. And um, that that's, the I think, the natural conclusion. Now, I don't think we will be able to get to 1.5, frankly. I don't think that's possible uh, with the current, where we're currently at. I would love if it was. Um, maybe we find some miracle way to do it, but uh, it doesn't seem possible from where we're at now. Two degrees sounds like a very good um, ambitious goal to, to keep. Might miss it a little bit. Hopefully we don't have tremendously bad impacts on, on the world. Certainly need to focus more on adaptation, but um, yeah, I don't know that much about optimism. <laughs> well, I truly appreciate that grounding in this work. Well, we are out of time, so we will wrap it up here. But thank you so much for joining us today. That was some incredible information that we appreciate. And uh, do your own research and also go on climatescience.org. All right. Thank you so uh, thank much. You. Have a good day. You too. Bye, Kari.